That is a great uh, song. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to a very unlikely resurrection passage. And that is Genesis chapter 5. We're going through the book of Genesis. You know what? I think the Holy Spirit can do what he wants. And uh, I think he can take any passage of Scripture and bring truth out of it uh, that uh, he would please. You remember, if you were with us, tuned in last week, in Genesis chapter 4, we had that horrible story of the first murder. Cain murdered his own brother. And as a result of that, it began an evil invasion into his personal life but also spread on a cultural level as well. And it permeated entire civilization. And you find seven generations of Cain impacted by that evil invasion. Genesis chapter 5, just before that fifth chapter begins, the last two verses, I think verse 25 and 26 of chapter 4, is kind of where I'm I'm hooking up again, because it tells us that after the murder of Abel, Adam and Eve had another son, his name Seth. His name means substitute. And I think it's a play on words, because if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 4 uh, for a moment with me, it says in verse 25, that uh, she called his name Seth, for God said she hath appointed me or substituted for me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So there's a play on words there, and uh, it is God substituted substitute, that's Seth, for Abel. Which also tells me that Eve was very hopeful. God's people are the most hopeful people on earth. And we're hopeful regardless of our circumstances because our lives aren't meaningless, because our lives are not about what's going on in them or around them. We have hope. We have hope now as well as in the future, and our hope is in God. As I believe, Eve's hope was in a God-promised deliverer that she thought perhaps Seth was that promised deliverer that God made mention of in the third chapter and the 15th verse, our very memory verse as a church. God-promised deliverance makes all life worth living. Seth had a son. We read also uh, in verse 26 of chapter 4, to Seth was also born a son. And look at, he called his name Enosh. And it says, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Seth named his son Enosh, which means frail. That's a good name for human beings, frail. I think that the name Enosh, frail, was a reminder that life is fragile because man is, because of sin, mortal. Man is mortal. I think his name connects to two remarkable things in that 26th verse, if you look again quickly at it. First of all, at that time, it says, people began to gather together to worship God, to proclaim his name, and to pray. Here we have the first record of public worship and believing prayer mentioned in the Bible. And this, I believe, is why a time such as what we're going through now in our 
in our city, our state, our country, our world is so vitally important for us if we take it right. It's always vital that we be reminded on a regular basis that we are mortals. That our life is fragile. That we are a dying people. And I think the result of that, that our mortality will drive us to seek the God that made us. I hear of people that are praying that never prayed before. That's a good thing. We need to realize that we are all Enosh. We are all frail. We are all mortal. And we need more than anything else. It was because of, I think, the reality of man's mortality that they gathered for public worship and believing prayer. And that's why our assembly is so important. That's why it's so important you're tuned in today. That's why it's so important that we meet on a regular basis. Because of our mortality, one day we're going to be there. One day we're going to be on the other side of this life. There is an afterlife because there's a God. And that is either a blessed thought to you or a fearful one. But I would say this, that mortality was not in God's original plan for human beings. But sin activated physical death in the human race. And we as a race of people are locked in to what I would call a chokehold. A chokehold of death. Before I go any further, I want us to pause a moment and pray. We need to do that. So, Heavenly Father, as we look to you again, we want you to accomplish your purpose in us opening the Scripture together and that you would get across the message of the Gospel to people. And if there are people that are listening and watching that aren't saved, save them by your power, by your provision, by your wonderful grace that has already been mentioned. And Lord, I pray that you would just draw us to yourself and show us the victory and the way out and the way of escape through Jesus, the resurrected Son of God. We pray it in his name. Amen. So we are locked in a deadly chokehold, I'm calling it, and I believe that the, the 31 verses that make up chapter 5 of Genesis really bear me out. I want to give you, however, a word of hope. Resurrection Sunday, what does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus defeated this deadly chokehold that mankind is held in, and he proved it by his resurrection. But look with me in Genesis chapter 5, beginning in the first verse. He says, this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Oh. So he is reiterating that man is a direct act of God's creation. Forget everything else that you learned in public education. Man is a direct, creative act of God. God created man, and notice this, again we are told, in his own likeness. If we are created in the likeness of God, that implies to me, people, that we are created by God with immortality. I mean that God's original intention for human beings is to not be subject to death. We're created in His likeness. He's the eternal God. We're not meant for mortality in the original plan of God. Look again at the passage. Verse uh, 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son, notice this, 
Interesting. In his own likeness. Doesn't say in God's likeness. In his own likeness, after his image. And he called his name Seth, which we've already met in verse 25 of chapter 4. He begat Seth. And as you read the 31 verses of Genesis chapter 5, you're going to see that there is a there's striking longevity. With the exception of three people, of all that are mentioned in this genealogy, they all live 900 plus years, which is interesting. But I think it's even more important to recognize that that longevity really reflects God's plan for mankind, which was immortality. God did not originally plan for man to die physically. I want you to compare that with today's average lifespan. In fact, I don't think it's a bad idea to once, it, once in a while take a walk through a cemetery and look at the tombstones find some interesting epitaphs. But one thing that is common with every tombstone that I've seen is basically this. You have a date recognizing the birth year of that person, a dash, and then another date recognizing the year of that person's death. It reminds me of a poem that I came across that I want to read to you. It's called The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that still can be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things that they say about you, how you lived your little dash? Now, that is totally a, a worldly viewpoint of life. I, I get that. But folks, how much more important is it for us as believers to be focused upon how we live our lives right here and now. And one of the best ways to, to celebrate the resurrection of our living and thrown Savior is to recognize the fact that there is resurrection power to live a life that pleases Him here and now. To live out that dash, if you will, in a way that honors our Savior is what life is really about. But one of the things that uh, I also wanted to bring to your attention in these 31 verses in chapter 5 is that you will find over and over again a familiar phrase. Eight times I've counted them. It says, so-and-so begat, and then he died. You see, Adam and Eve unleashed a mortal enemy that laid siege to humanity. God warned them, he said, in the day that you eat of that fruit that I forbid you to eat of, thou shalt surely die. And when they ate of it, a mortal enemy descended upon humanity. But that enemy was defeated by Jesus, the Messiah. And that enemy was defeated at the cross 
when he hung on that tree, when he took our sins in his body and paid our sin debt, he defeated that enemy death on that cross. And the proof again is the resurrection, that he's alive. And one day, death is going to be totally overcome. It's going to be totally eradicated. And we are going to be forever with the Lord in a beautiful city called the New Jerusalem that eventually will rest on a new earth. And there'll be no more death. Revelation 21.4 tells us that. But that dreadful finality of that sad and solemn repetition of death, and he died, and he died, and he died, over and over again, the consequence of sin. Bible tells us that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin so that death passed upon all men for that all have sin with only two exceptions that I've ever found in the Bible two exceptions two men that did not die a physical death we're going to see the first one here in this fifth chapter the second one is the prophet Elijah. They're the only two exceptions that we know of. And isn't it also important to recognize the fact that as we saw in the ending of chapter 4 last week, that there was a progressing and an advancing of the culture, and yet we still die. Still die. I want you to see something else here. I emphasize that third verse that Seth was born to Adam and he is said to be in Adam's own likeness and image. In other words, he's a natural man. And he carries the character of his parents. Ouch. Our children get passed down to them, our sinfulness. And the character and the flaws that are in me are seen in my children, in our own likeness, in our own image. Thankfully, the divine image, though it was damaged, was not totally erased. There's still hope for a connection with the God that made us. But I want you to turn now to verses 21 to 24, because here we meet one of the two exceptions of people in the Bible that are said to have never died. Notice it in verse 21, and Enoch lived 65 years, and he begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Death has a chokehold on humanity. But here is a course changer, I think. Here is an astonishing paragraph that sticks out in the middle of what I would call a boring genealogy. Here is right smack in the middle between creation and the flood, a break in the formula. He begat and he died. He begat and he died. Here's an exception to it. And notice in verse 24 what it says. Here is the reason for that ex exception. It says, Enoch walked with God. Now, walking with God, I don't believe that this was the physical walking with God that perhaps Adam and Eve enjoyed, as implied in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, when it says that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. That is, physically, he, he, he took on a physical manifestation and uh, walked with them in the garden. 
I don't think that that's what's happening here with Enoch, but I think it's, it's the same thing. In essence, it is simply that he had intimate fellowship with God. He enjoyed an intimate form of fellowship with the Lord that, uh, that, uh, that is special because it's between God and a man, God and a person. Did you know that there is nothing that God wants more from human beings than that very thing? I hate to put it this way, but just for our understanding, God lives for that. God lives for fellowship with mankind. That's why God created us. He wants a loving relationship with you and with me. And this is what God lives for. This is what he wants most from mankind. And here's a man that for 300 years of his life, he walked with God. He enjoyed this intimate fellowship with the Lord. And uh, that put such meaning in this man's life. And that's what puts meaning in any human life. Walking with God. Fellowship with the Lord. It'll make your life so purposeful. In fact, meaningful life is a life that is God-focused, a life that is centered on Him. That's what brings meaning to life. That'll keep you from any suicide thought. Walking with God. Intimacy with Him. Hey, if you're struggling with thoughts of suicide, let me tell you, that's from the devil. He's a murderer from the beginning. And the, the key to that is that you cry out to God and you look to him and you connect with him. Open your Bible and find out who he is and how much he cares for you and how he wants you to have this fellowship and walk with him. Life has meaning when we walk with God. He provides a great opportunity right now for you. You know what? In some sense, this is downtime. Don't waste it watching Netflix. That's what the world does. The world says, okay, this is a time to binge on movies. But God says, this is a time for you to meet with me. And perhaps this COVID-19 plague is meant to get you to meet with God, to stop the fast pace to stop your running, and to get you to sit down and listen and look to the Lord. This is a perfect time for it. Take advantage of the opportunity. You may not have one again like this. He walked with God. And look at verse 24 again. He was not. <laughs> he vanished. He vanished because he walked with God. One day he vanished. In other words, he did not die. He was not, the Bible says, because God, he vanished because God took him. You know what this is a preview of? This is a preview of death's defeat. This is a picture of God's redemptive plan. I remember reading a true story of a submarine that, that sunk, and they sent divers down to try to rescue these sailors in the sub. And they heard the, the men inside of the submarine knocking on the, the sub, and they realized it was Morse code. And they read the Morse code from the knocking of the men in the sub, and it simply said was, is there any hope? This whole human race is on a sinking sub. And I want to tell you there's hope. And we see it in this man's life. He walked with God and he defied death as a result of that. God has a plan. God took him, the Bible says. There are scriptures uh, in the book of Psalms that use this same terminology, different uh, words in the English, but the same Hebrew word, for example, in the book of uh, Psalm 49, verse 15, it says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. That is, took him. Take me. He shall receive me. Or how about Psalm 23, verse 24? 
Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and after receive me to glory, take me to glory. He walked with God, and there came a day when God took him, when God received him, when God brought him to where God dwells without him having to go through the valley of the shadow of death at all. It's an example of the escaping of physical death. You say, is that possible? Absolutely. It happened here. And this is really a man that was raptured prior to the flood, the judgment of a universal flood. He's raptured. And I think it also perhaps may hint to us that the Bible teaches that there is going to be a rapture of the church prior to the tribulation, that 70th week of Daniel. Because we're told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but rather to deliverance. And this is a, I think, a hint of that very thing. It opens the door. What we see happening to this man, that he walked with God, and as a result was not banished. God took him. God brought him to heaven without death. What we see here is, is a, uh, the opening of a door of resurrection. God breaks the laws of science, and he takes Enoch to heaven without death. And I would say that as a result of that, that man was immediately glorified because 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says that flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life. It certainly says that when we are raised, we'll be raised with glorified bodies, resurrection bodies. So what a course changer. One more point. And that is verses 28 to 32. And here we meet, I think, a familiar man. Lamech, he lived 100, verse 28, 82 years, and he begat a son. And he called his name, you know this guy, Noah. The same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years, begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old when he had those three significant boys. But my point is not that. My point is what I see in that 29th verse. What I see in that 29th verse is a possible curse buster. What I see in the naming of Lamech's son, Noah, is the expression of a deep down heart longing of this father for some relief from the extreme difficulty of a life that is under the curse that was pronounced in Genesis chapter 3. It says, and Lamech begat a son. Have you noticed many times in the book of Genesis that the birth of a child is linked to hope? Seth, here, now, again, Noah, and it's linked to hope because there is that underlying reality that our lives are lived under a curse. Our lives are lived in a fallen world. And men want relief from the extreme difficulty. You remember how God said, uh, to Adam in Genesis 3.17, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not even eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Lord, is there not some comfort from this? Some relief? I believe that Lamech felt that the birth of his son gave hope for at least a lessening of the effects of that curse. That's what's expressed in his naming him and saying what he says about him in verse 29. Look at the name. 
Noah. The name Noah, it means rest. And it sounds like the Hebrew word for comfort. See that? He named him Noah. The same shall comfort us. Not the same words, but it sounds the same in the Hebrew language. He named him Noah, which means rest, because he wanted Nacham, comfort. He wanted to be given rest. And so this stands out as a pivotal time in human history. That there is hope expressed here for the bringing in of rest and comfort that was needed for troubled humanity. And there is, but it's not probably the way that Lamech intended or envisioned. Remember the ark? We'll see that. We'll see that in a couple of chapters. And then the covenant after the flood that God made with Noah and mankind, an everlasting covenant that really brought some level of rest and comfort to humanity for hope. And so he's not far off in saying what he says in that 29th verse. Again, I just want to conclude by saying this. Man's first enemy, Genesis 2.17, is death. But death has also become man's last enemy. We are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be vanquished by our Savior is physical death. So I want to suggest to you that Messiah Jesus is the curse buster. He is the one that breaks the curse once and for all because he is the fulfillment of Genesis 3:15. The Bible says that at the cross he crushed Satan's head under his heel and Satan bruised his heel, of course, in death. But he was raised from death, the victor. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, in verse uh, 51 through 57, these wonderful words that I want to refresh your heart with as we close this morning. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality, God's plan for mankind. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, and it's in that order, incorruption first and then immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, and that is in Isaiah, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Here it is. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through the curse buster, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not ready for death, you better prepare for it. You don't know how much time you have left to prepare for it. And if you're not prepared to meet your maker, you either don't know that you need to prepare, or you somehow convince yourself that you don't need to worry about that, that there's nothing to fear. Well, I want to tell you, if you're not ready to meet God, you should fear. You should fear because the Bible says every single one of us is going to stand before God one day, and we are going to give an account of ourselves personally. And Paul says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You better fear, or you will, but it will be too late. You can conquer fear. You can conquer fear. You can conquer that fear of death or any other fear. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. 
And the love of God is perfect love, and it casts out all fear. And you're not tormented by the fear of death. And that's what you need to do. Now, I came across a, another poem that actually is a song as well, that I think ties together everything that I wanted to say today. If I would have had a different title for this message, instead of uh, our uh, a mortal enemy, I would have titled this message, There Is No Death. It is not death to die, to leave this weary road and join the saints who dwell on high, who've found their home with God. It is not death to close the eyes long dimmed by tears and wake in joy before your throne delivered from our fears. It is not death to fling aside this earthly dust and rise with strong and noble wing to live among the just. It is not death to hear the key unlock the door that sets us free from mortal years to praise you evermore. Oh, Jesus, conquering the grave, your precious blood has power to save. And those who trust in you will in your mercy find that it is not death to die. Someone else said life's short, death's sure, sin the cause, Christ the cure. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we are thankful and we are looking to you. We thank you that the Lord Jesus, the Messiah and Savior, is the ultimate curse buster. He will one day fully remove this old curse. And I thank you for the evidence of that in the life of a man called Enoch, who walked with you and you took him, you received him, and he did not die. Lord, I thank you also for the fact that although death has a chokehold on humanity right now, that last enemy is going to be seen as defeated one day. And everything then, when we look back, we will see worth it all. Thank you for this truth. And if anyone here is not saved, may they right now confess their sin to you and say, Oh Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you, but I'm asking you to forgive me on the basis of what Jesus the Messiah did for me on that tree. And I want to receive him and his forgiveness I want him to be my savior. I pray for Jesus' sake.